Buenos dias, Wes, and thank you for joining us today at Business Spotlight Series. Today, I am excited to introduce Wes Beard, Managing Director of Conversable, whose mission is to enable business and organizations to chat better with their customers online. Welcome, Wes. Hi, Javier. Thanks for having me. Pleasure. Now, Wes, um, my first question is always, how do, do you end up doing what you do, setting up this business? Is this something that, that you, you had in your head for a long time, or how did it come up? Um, so you could say, I, I guess, entrepreneurship wasn't in my genes at an early age. You know, I, I was one of those people that was very much an academic-focused uh, kid. I went through school, got my, got my straight A's, went to university, got my degree, then went into the world of work and sort of followed a path, as it were. Followed, it, went to the corporate rat race, um, worked in that space for about 20 years. And then as I approached sort of middle age, I kind of looked looked at what my life could potentially end up like as I was sort of nearing uh, nearing my, my deathbed and uh, looked back and I thought, is, is this what I want to do for the next 40 years? And the answer was no. Um, I wanted to make a change. I wanted to find something that was more fulfilling for me, that that felt like it was giving me more control of my life. Um, and uh, there was a number of things at, the, at that time that were going on. I was doing a part-time MBA, um, thinking about other business ideas, listening to a lot of podcasts, mainly from the US, about entrepreneurship, and uh, basically got the bug. Um, we had a we had a talk in my MBA from a founder uh, of a very successful business based in Glasgow uh, called It Is On, uh, which is a bit like sort of Groupon for hospitality. And uh, it was just a very inspiring talk. Um, and that gave me the, the sort of impetus to say, OK, I think I think I want to do this. Um, tried a couple of things that failed miserably, um, but then this chatbot technology sort of came along um, in 2016, felt there was a real need for that uh, within some of the uh, businesses that I was speaking to in my corporate job. And then one thing led to another uh, that involved me meeting my business partner um, in 2017. And then we decided at that point that we were going to start a business. So maybe not a typical path, but uh, definitely one I don't regret. Yeah, not, yeah, not a typical path at all. I mean, there are very few academics or perfect students that I know that uh, jump onto the world of business. So, uh, yeah, well done. Um, now, have things pan out the, the, the way you thought when you uh, started the business? Absolutely not. <laughs> um, I think it's, uh, I guess, a lesson in resilience. You know, um, you, you sort of have a have a view that you know you'll start this business and all of a sudden customers will come flocking you know at, at the time um back in 2016 when we first thought about the business chatbots was really a very new concept um you know most people i'd spoken to at the time didn't know what a chatbot was and now here we are in 2024 almost everyone knows what a chatbot is um when we first launched the business, you know, we launched our technology and we thought immediately we'll be able to bring bring clients on. They'll they'll just get it. Um, and the reality was that that wasn't the case. You know, we had to do, we had to really take a step back and think, okay, how do we position our product in the right way? It was a lot about sort of educating people really to sort of get them to understand what this technology could do. Um, but even as we've gone through the course of business, you know, we've had to adapt constantly um you know a great example of that's covid you know during the pandemic and thinking about how what do we need to do with our business um thinking about new technologies that were coming along um things like this sort of open ai stuff the growth of whatsapp you know we've had to look at those things and constantly evolve and adapt um and also adapt to the markets that we operate in you know um one of the great things about our business is we're industry agnostic. So, you know, we don't have to focus just on a specific industry. We can work across multiple industries. So we had to think about, okay, if, if there's one industry that's maybe struggling, uh, maybe it's the property market, uh, um, you know, our estate agents doing so well, do we need to think about pivoting into another industry, which is a bit more successful, even if it's on a temporary basis. So, um, yeah, so definitely not being a straight line, um, Javier, it's been very much a, yeah. So probably roller coaster. Yeah. <laughs> I think anybody watching this recording will, will that will, that will resonate, and they they'll be nodding their heads. Um, so basically, anybody who has a website is a potential client. Is that right? 
That's right. Yeah. I mean, we're really seeing a, a sort of a fundamental shift. And, and we have seen this now over a number of years about how consumers want to communicate with businesses. You know, if you go sort of right back to the beginning, I mean, obviously it was it was through like a phone call or sending a letter. And then we've it, it evolved into things like email in the late 90s, early 2000s. Um, but now we're sort of moving into a world where the world is moving fast you know people are people are impatient they want to get things done quickly um, but they also want that really really high level of service that you know you would expect from any any business and uh online chat is a is a great way of achieving that goal um and you know historically again it's been mainly live chat has been the sort of dominant force in in the kind of online chat space but that technology again has evolved quite significantly over the last, certainly the last five years since we were, um, since we started the business. Um, you know, AI chatbots were really quite cumbersome um, a few years ago. You had to use very, very expensive uh, technology to achieve that. Typically, it was only reserved for enterprise. But now that's sort of unlocked to the masses with the likes of, um, you know, Chat GPT type models. Um, and alongside that, you know, we've seen a lot of growth in WhatsApp. You know, um, most customers these days are quite happy to communicate with businesses over WhatsApp. Um, and the great thing about WhatsApp is it's a secure channel, um, but it's instant. It's instant and convenient. You know, so as a business, you can get your message out to those customers at the time of their choosing. So they're not having to sit on a phone call in a queue for half an yes. hour or yes. a live chat sort of one and done conversation it's very much a, a deeper relationship than that well i had a i think a few deliveries with uh was it dhl and they they communicate with you through whatsapp which is very very yeah. good. you don't need to log in or the more you know whatsapp is very so uh yeah it's many companies are converging technologies um but I, I find personally a bit, you know, when I'm on the on the cha on the uh, chatbot when communicating, I can see AI, and it's sometimes a bit frustrating, you know. Uh, it doesn't yeah. quite, uh, get it uh, yes. in some cases, but um, yeah, it takes a little bit of time to be understood. Uh, and when yeah, that's right. And, you know, I think there's a lot of people out there that um, you know. There's a huge amount of frustration, certainly in the, in the early days of chatbots. You know, I'll be the first to admit our chatbot technology wasn't the best on the market by any stretch. You know, um, I think where we are now in, in sort of 2024, there has been a real step change in, in the power of AI and what that can do for good or for bad, um, frankly. Um, but um, I think the other important thing with um, with AI is that it's about how you deploy it, you know, and that, that's one of the things that we always say to clients is, you know, it's all well and good seeing you want to use AI, but you still have to make sure that it's secure, it's protecting your customer data, it's providing accurate responses, and those are things that you just can't do with a sort of simple plug and play. You need to make sure that you're, you, you know, you're choosing a, a company or a provider that is able to build out an AI solution for you, which will work for your business um, yeah. and make it relevant for you, you know? So it, the technology has really improved um, and I think it will continue to do so, you know, over the next few years. Yeah. What, um, Wes, what would you say to, to business owners who run small and medium-sized businesses and they are kind of lay in the, you know, digital world, uh, they, 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 they don't understand it very well and they don't have the time to sit down and understand the technology and how to integrate it with their needs in the business. Um, how, what, what advice will you give to them from the industry perspective? You know, how can they, they improve their business to communicate better with their clients and, and, and not to lose leads and, and give good customer service now that you are in this industry? What will you suggest to these people? Yeah, I, th I think it's all about really ed educating, you know, it's it's making the time to sort of understand what solutions are out there. Um, and also looking at, you know, looking at your web, looking at the simple things, you know, look at your website, you know, it's it's your digital, digital shop front, you know, it's the thing that your customers are seeing all the time, you know, and how is that optimized You put yourself in the customer's shoes, like how easily can they find the information they need? Um, working with a good, you know, an agency is obviously a good option, but there are also some really amazing um, self-serve tools on the market now, which can really help. Um, again, I don't want to put my 
sales hat on, but you know, you, speaking to businesses like ours who can sort of really help and guide you um, through what you want to achieve with these things um, is also, you know, use the experts, you know, don't, don't try to sort of be an expert, be an expert in your own business. But when it comes to some of these other technologies, don't be afraid to ask experts in their respective industries. Um, that would, you know, that would be what I would, I would recommend. Brilliant. Um, regarding, I mean, you were pre-COVID, uh, did COVID help you, help your business? Because everybody stopped going to the office and, you know, digital world became became even more prevalent. What, uh, how did that hit you? Um, it, it was pretty tough, if I'm honest. Um, and the reason I say that is because we're... You know, we're not a massively funded business. You know, we are an SME ourselves. Um, we're not a business that, you know, received $50 million of funding through venture capital, that kind of stuff. You know, if, if you were Zoom, for example, uh, as we're talking on now, you know, those sorts of companies obviously receive significant levels of, of funding and they have amazing brand awareness. And so when when things like COVID happened, um, you know, there were people that were already aware of pro uh, platforms like that, that that then really caused those to spike we we didn't have the budgets or the funding to sort of do that you know so a, a lot of people still don't really know about us and we a lot of our um our challenge and our uh our our kind of plans going forward about how do we raise awareness um of of our of our company what it can do so covid was a difficult time for us you know we had to we had to furlough a couple of people for a while um we took advantage of the government kickstart scheme which was a fantastic program. Uh, it was to try and get younger people back into work. Uh, we we took advantage of that program. We ended up bringing in, I think, around nine people in total um, wow. over the start period. We've actually ended up keeping a few of those people um, and they're still within the business today. Um, I'm a massive fan of sort of bringing in young, young talent and nurturing them. Um, but we also, you know, are, I guess you could say to a degree, we're also right place, right time with our own technology. We ended up getting involved in a project with NHS Scotland um, about how to sort of manage the PPE ordering process using chatbot type technology and automation. So uh, we ended up building out that that project and that really helped us through the pandemic, you know, and, and it was great to be able to be building a system that was doing good um at the same time as obviously helping to pay the bills um as we were as we were going through that that period but it was definitely a tough time yeah no it's certainly the wash um how, how many people do you have in the team at the moment after you you know as of today yeah so we're still a very small team uh, we have six in the team um in the uk we have a development team overseas of six as well um so 12 in total across uh um, sort of the commercial side of the business, which is in the UK, uh, our sales and operations team work here along with our customer success. And then we have our development team based over um, overseas. And uh, what is your criteria when you recruit people? I mean, many businesses are finding very difficult to recruit, to recruit yeah. talent, to retain talent. Um, and uh, what are you looking for in people who you want to work uh, with you in, in the business? I think, um, I, I don't know if this is a cliche or not, but really, um, you know, when I was working in the corporate world and recruiting, there was a, it was a very much a look at the CV and base on the CV, a very black and white type of approach. And uh, and actually, as as we've run Conversable, um, I take the opposite view, um, and I think it's very much about the person, um, the personality and the, and most important, the attitude. So... Yeah. What we're looking for is someone who you know you get a real sense of um their kind of drive ambition they've got a positive frame of mind and i think you know you can typically pick that up i find within the first sort of 10 minutes of meeting someone you know just having those basic personal skills i think is really really important yes. um, one of the other things I, I had underestimated which has been a big learning lesson for us when we've been sort of going through recruitment over the years is um, I am a big fan of personality tests. And uh, I used to sort of um, take a very, uh, I don't know what the word is. I, I used to be quite um, unsure about them, about unsure about the accuracy and a bit skeptical per perhaps, but actually they're usually very accurate. And so now when we recruit, we typically um, for the final stage round of our process, we'll usually use a personality test and they're 
pretty much bang on in terms of yes. what the person ends up being. So yeah, big fan of those from a practical I get it, I get it. Have you heard of DISC? Yes. Yeah. 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 We, yeah. we use that behavioral uh, test is, is, is formidable, you know. It, exactly. Yeah. yeah. And, it, and, and it's so accurate, you know. Yeah. Um, I think it's a really good practical way yeah. of just understanding people. Yeah. Um, Brilliant. Brilliant. Um, okay. So um, what's, uh, what are the, the plans for the company for the next five years? Where would we like to, to be five years from now? Yeah, so we're um, we're actually in the process of raising investment uh, at the moment again uh, to sort of accelerate the growth of the business. Um, we're in a sort of fortunate position in that we're uh, almost able to sustain ourselves um, cash flow wise, um, so we can then reinvest back into the team. So what what does that mean for us? Well, we're looking to do a couple of things. So first of all, we're looking to grow more into that kind of enterprise space. Um, so we have a couple of big clients in that in that space at the moment, um, but we want to do more uh, with enterprise. Um, but we also want to expand out in the industries that we're working already within the SME space. So at the moment, we typically tend to work within the dental industry, automotive industry and recruitment. Um, very Three very different industries, but I, I think it sort of demonstrates how flexible our solution can be. Um, but we want to we want to do other industries as well. So looking at hotels, for example, universities. Um, and then looking to grow into uh, global markets through partnerships. So um, we already have a couple of clients in the US. We've got one in um, Switzerland randomly, a couple in Australia. Uh, we want to, we want to do more in those um, foreign markets as well. Um, partnerships is probably the first way we'll look to do that, but we we might well go in directly as well. Brilliant. Um... What will you what what piece of advice would you give to people um, who are watching this recording who are like you you know you came from corporate you're working for somebody else and then you took the the plunge to go into business they are sitting on the on the fringe and they are not you know this uncertainty moving away from the paycheck at the end of the month to running your own business what what would you say to them to encourage them to to take the the step I think it's all about um... You know, ultimately, it's about doing. You know, entrepreneurship is about t doing and taking action. But I think it would be glib for me to say, quit your job and do it now. You know, I think there is an element of you do. You know, you do need to be um, aware of the the risks and the challenges to that. It's you know, it's it, it's a tough move to make. Um, I have no regrets making that move. Um, but, you know, if, if I was to sort of go through it again, I'd be um, sort of thinking about like um, that that kind of how, how can I reduce that risk to myself? So, um, you know, do I genuinely have something that I think is solving a product in the market? And do I believe so much in that that it's worth me taking that risk? Um, if I speak to customers or potential customers, am I absolutely sure that these are customers that will pay for this product? If I then go to launch it um, to the market, um, and I think if if those the answer to those questions are yes, then you know I I I would go for it. You know, um, I think one of the things I've always sort of been thinking about throughout the, my life, I guess, the course of the business is you only you only have one chance at life. I think so. You know, what kind of life do you want to? To live I know, I know it sounds sort of quite cheesy but um you know do you want to be just doing the same thing as you're doing that's absolutely fine for some people you know um if, if that's what you want to do more power to you but if you do have a niggle in the back of your mind and you have something that you think people want and you have something that people think will pay for the, the yes. difference between businesses that are successful and those that aren't are the people that have yes. taken that jump and done it yes i think i think you said earlier on that uh, you, you didn't want to get to 80 with a regret of not having done what you could have done yeah exactly yeah, yeah 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 and there are a million people out there who said i wish i'd built a rocket that yeah. could try and go to mars but yeah. only elon musk is now doing it you know <laughs> great great, great uh, now um do you have a, a favorite book that has had an influence in your life and you would like to share um there's Probably a, a couple of books actually that sort of stick with me. Um, and they're maybe not the ones that you kind of typically familiar with when it comes to business books, but one one of them is called Influence or uh, The Power of Influence by um, a guy called Robert Cialdini. 
Um, it's a fantastic book to sort of understand how people think and how people buy and, and how you can influence people in a positive way. And one of the things I like about it is it's not sort of one of these airy fairy books that's sort of very talking very hypothetically, but it's all grounded in data. So a lot of the stuff that they prove out has been done through it, lots of experiments and various things. So one example is... Um, you know when you uh, when you give a, a restaurant gives you the bill, and they were looking at how much a customer would pay as a tip if they didn't leave a mint or they left a mint with the bill. So they they put the bill down, and the tip was maybe five percent. They put one mint with the with the with the bill, and their tip went up by five percent. And they did it with two mints, and it went up again. And they actually measure the effects of these things. And there's a lot of learning lessons on that when it comes wow. to. How how humans think and, and yeah. how you can how you can influence them through your way of thinking. So that's the first one. The other one that I uh, I think has been really useful for us is one called Blue Ocean Strategy. Um, and again, it's it, the, the concept is all about how there are companies that operate in this sort of frothing red ocean of competition. And how can you as a business look to position yourself in the blue ocean? So you might be operating within the same industry. Um, you might be doing very similar things but what can you do that's just that little bit different that that puts you in that space of sort of opening you up to the, the rest of the market? A good example for us is an automotive. The, the web chat space is actually very, very competitive in that space. There's probably about eight to nine competitors in that space. And we tried competing in that space for some time and we have a bit of success there, but we decided to put, reposition our product in, in that space through WhatsApp. Um, and I, I humbly believe that we're so one of the only and most advanced WhatsApp API providers in, in, in the auto industry at the moment. Um, and so we're operating now in a blue ocean that is able to capture a market share where it wouldn't have otherwise existed. So that whole blue ocean piece, again, very interesting book, lots of practical um, use cases and case studies on it. So, yeah. Brilliant. So here for the people watching this recording, those two books. I'll take I'll take out the one the power of influence. Is it a red book by any chance? I, I bought a book. Is it a red red bright red cover or not? Oh, um, I think the one I read was blue, but I would probably change it. Yeah, I, I <laughs> bought one at the airport years and years ago, and it was I remember the word influence, and it was bright yes, red. That's and, the one. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that's the one. Uh, yeah. yeah. Brilliant, yeah. brilliant. Well, Wes, it's been it's been amazing to have you here on board with uh, with us today at Business Spotlight Series, and and thank you so much for sharing your experience and wisdom with us today. Thank you. Thanks very much, Javi. Appreciate it.